All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Association of IT Professionals, North Central Florida Chapter. I'm Dom Pizet, Chapter President. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening, and we've got an exciting talk lined up with Mr. Daniel Lowry from IT Pro TV. He's going to be presenting on the OWASP Top 10, uh, which if you've never heard of, don't worry. He's about to tell us what it all means and what it is. Uh, network security is certainly a big thing that we need to be concerned with, and web applications are at risk. OWASP Top 10 is all about identifying those risks and resolving it. Now, I do want to remind everybody that AITP is a association, and we are always looking to reach out and help other people get more involved in the IT community. So please share uh, the, the, the link to our group, you know, any information with any friends, anybody you think may benefit from being a part of our group. It's really a chance for us to get together and network and Kind of learn a little bit more about what's going on out there, other people's experience with technologies, and to learn a little bit about something. So uh, I want to give an extra big thank you to Daniel for taking some time out of his evening. Uh, I do actually work with him during the day, so I know that he was actually at work today. He did put in a solid eight hours, and, <laughs> and so then taking time out of his evening to come and talk to us is something that I greatly appreciate. I know the whole chapter does as well. All right, well, enough about me. I'm going to hand things over to Daniel. So, Daniel, take it away. Hey, I got this nice little prompt. It says unmutes. So, I'll take advantage of that. Uh, it's easier than trying to hunt around for it. Uh, I'll just quickly introduce myself. Don's done a great job. I appreciate the quick introduction. Just, I do security for IT Pro TV as far as I teach the security concepts and practices that people need to know to get into security as a profession. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do every day of the week. And um, I thought what would be better than if we kind of went over the OWASP top 10. It's kind of a, a mainstay in security. If you haven't heard of it before, you're in for a real treat because it's just the 10 nightmare scenarios that happen most commonly when you have a web application that faces the internet. And you have to worry about whether or not that application is going to be hacked in some way, shape or form. Um, unfortunately, this, these are the things that happen often, uh, so we've got to be on the lookout for them, right? If we don't know they exist, then how are we supposed to defend against them? And if we don't know what those most common things are, that we could just, those low-hanging fruit, that if we just took some time to understand what they are and how they work and maybe a little bit of uh, what we could do to avoid them, then we might have a more secure landscape out there than what we are currently seeing at the moment. So let me see if I can share my screen. Let's do that. Let's see here, my screen is there. That's the one I wanna share. Share this with the good folks out there. All right, so here is OWASP. This is the Open Web Application Security Project. If, if I'm not mistaken, Wes will correct me on that if I'm wrong, because he is the acronym king uh, and I am the acronym SURF. Peasants, horrible with acronyms, uh, but that's neither here nor there. We've got a lot of interesting things. So what OWASP is, is just an organization that have, of security professionals that have come together and say, here's what we see as professionals, people bringing in, bringing in the, uh, their experience, bringing in their resources, the things that they've gone through, the things that they see on a daily basis and aggregating it and doing some analytics on that and saying, oh, you know what, we can make this a real resource for people out there and we'll make this top 10 security vulnerabilities that you need to look out for if you're running a web application. They do other things in security as well, but this was like their big claim to fame. Uh, and now OWASP is a huge project. It's a phenomenal project. They have so many different resources. It is, they really do give back to the community and uh, I don't know that they charge a single cent for any of it. Uh, it's just them wanting to have a more robust security landscape out there. I'll accept their cookies if I must. But uh, here we go. It says globally recognized by developers as the first step toward more secure coding. Full disclosure, these are for most, a lot of this is for people that are developing web applications, but just because we're not developing them per se, doesn't mean we don't need to know about them because we can help the developers by finding them for them and saying, yeah, I missed a spot. We need to go back and take a look at that and do a proper SDLC. So I, I do like how they do tell you this is a moral imperative. Companies should adopt 
right there. There's the moral, should adopt this document. Start the process of ensuring that their web applications minimize these risks. So let's get the party started with injection. Um, this, this is number one with a bullet for a reason, has been number one for quite some time. The OWASP top 10 usually refreshes once every three years. We missed 2020, thanks COVID, awesome. So it didn't quite get through to making that happen for 2020. They're working on it uh, for 2021 to get that out there. But right now we're on 2017. I highly doubt that 2021 is gonna be a whole lot different. There might be some, some maneuvering, some moving of pieces, maybe some squishing of different things. This is typically what happens in the OWASP. Every now and then something new rears its ugly head and starts making splashes out there in the community and then it gets added to the list. But for the most part, it's been pretty static for quite some time. Every now and then they move something. But this one, injection, is the number one, has been the number one for a hot minute. And the reason that is, is because it's really hard to keep it from happening. Typically you are taking in input from an end user. If I make a web application, this and that's full disclosure, I didn't know what a web application was until about three or four years ago. What that means is a website that does things. I think we gotta get fancy, right? That's what we do. So a web application is just some sort of web-based software really that we interact with using our browser, like a Facebook, like a Twitter, like IT Pro TV, right? We have a web application. You go there, you can log in, you have an experience that's customized to you. That's our application. How you maneuver around that is something we need to be worried about as far as security goes because I'm taking input from you as a user. What's your username? What's your password? Basic, simple stuff. But it is data that's now being processed by the server through the application. So there's, there's some coding going on behind the scenes. And if I have the ability or if the programmers have not done a good job of really looking at what that input is and scrutinize, scrutinizing it, making sure it is what we think it should be and not something we don't want it to be, then we might have an issue. So this is where injection comes in. There are different types of injection you have. As you can see, SQL injection, NoSQL injection. I loved that one when uh, NoSQL databases started becoming really popular. People thought NoSQL, NoSQL injection. Wrong. <laughs> you still have uh, NoSQL injections. They are still there. Uh, OS, right? The operating system itself. You might be hooking your web application into the operating system on the back end. Hey, you already can do this. There's no reason for me to reinvent the wheel. I'll just ask the operating system to do it for me if someone tries to do X, Y, or Z function. Well, how does that get done? Well, the programmer says, I've got a little piece of syntax I can write and say, hey, operating system, we're living a great life together. Could you please ever so kindly perform X function for me? And he goes, I sure can, no problem. And it does it and then it returns the results. And then the website renders that onto your web browser and you get that information back in your browser, everybody's happy. Hackers get super happy. I love OS injection when I'm able to say, hey, operating system, do me a favor. I would like to have a terminal here on my machine coming from you. If you could make that happen, that'd be great. And it goes, okay, well, you didn't tell me I couldn't do it. So why not? Sounds like fun. So you're starting to see some of the dangers wrapped around injection. If you haven't heard of SQL injection, that's probably one of the bigger kids on the block when it comes to injection. There's also code injection where I'm actually able to give it code and have it <laughs> run the code, which is probably, it's bad, it's usually bad, right? Uh, but SQL injection is where I'm interacting with a database, but the database uses a query language, which is like a programming language. So I'm able to inject into it if I can find a good spot Typically you'll see some things like a, like a login page is a great spot to look for like SQL injections. I'll use a character like a single quote because single quotes are special characters for the T SQL language. If it interprets that as a special character and not just as some ordinary thing, or if we're not going, hey, you put a, a single quote in there. Yeah, we don't like that. We're gonna go ahead and remove that. 
take that out. And then the rest of this is fine. But you do that business again, we'll have words. So you have like application, web application firewalls that will look for special characters like that, try to remove them. These are, you're starting to see the cat and mouse game that's getting played. I'm going to try to throw some stuff at it, see what the application does. Hopefully the programmers are doing a really good job of sanitizing, of basically not trusting the user but to attempt. And I know it's like, oh, that doesn't seem like a very nice community thing to do. That's not being cool. Well, not everybody's cool, right? Yeah, there you go. That's That's the thing of it. So I have to assume somebody somewhere might even be uh, impersonating someone who I trust. So therefore, I'm just going to not trust anything that comes from the web app without first running it through the ringer, and making sure that it actually is what I expect it to be. And uh, with SQL attacks, I can dump databases. I can add to the database. I can delete the database. That's always a fun one. I actually saw somebody had a, um, <laughs> it was a, um, a license plate that was a SQL query to drop all the tables. So if they ran through a red light and the camera took it, it might hopefully interpret that <laughs> as SQL and then do that, which would be kind of funny, but wrong. You shouldn't do that. That's all the other thing is don't do these things unless you got permission or it's your own stuff, right? So if you want to play with SQL injection, that's cool. You should learn about it, understand how that works, understand how command injection, code injection works. You can use something like the um, broken web application. It's called the BWAP. Um, it's really cool. It's a good, it's like a virtual appliance. You just run it in some virtualization software and then do it locally. Don't, don't let it touch the internet because it's horribly insecure. But it'll allow you to walk through a lot of um, some of these things, kind of play with looking for them, testing for them. OWASP has a ton of, of great stuff as well. WebGoat, uh, WebWolf. They've got the OWASP juice shop, which are all like these tools that you can use to kind of like get your feet wet, understanding how these attacks can work and then going, oh, OK, now I see what that looks like. Now we can start doing things to try to protect against it. All right. That's enough on injection. I think that's good. Hopefully you guys are understanding that. Let's go to broken authentication. Uh, broken authentication. This is number two. Application functions related to authentication and session management are often implemented incorrectly. Oh, well, that's fun, isn't it? Allowing attackers to compromise password keys or session tokens or to exploit other implementation flaws to assume other users' identities temporarily or permanently. What's interesting is, and hopefully you're, you're already seeing this or, or realizing it, that a lot of these, you know, we've got injection as number one. Well, we've got broken authentication as number two. What's interesting, I can use a SQL injection to bypass authentication. So it's actually kind of both. And you'll see that out here. So if you get like weirdly confused about where does, where does this sit, uh, that's not uncommon because it can be uh, a can, an amalgamization of, of a few of these and it would rightly sit in any of those spots. So if I did a SQL injection, it would rightly be a one and or a two, okay? So broken authentication is just getting around authentication was bad. It doesn't, doesn't really do what it should do. And there's a bunch of different ways in which it could happen. But unfortunately, this is, it's number two on the list. Like you would think, we, I'm pretty sure most people get it that security is like a, an important thing. And yet they put up some janky authentication mechanisms that don't work really well, or they don't secure it very well. And that allows an attacker to kind of walk around the fence and go, they, they didn't build any fence right here. So I, yeah, it was a long walk over here, but I walked and now I'm on the other side of the fence and I made it to where I want to be. Um, so this can come by way of like session manipulation. Maybe I can steal somebody's token and impersonate them. You know, I'm bypassing authentication at that point. It didn't verify that I am who I say I am. It just assumed because I had the right credentials that that's what's up. So broken authentication is, again, shows itself in a, in a myriad of different ways, allowing you to use poor passwords. We're going to also talk about um, access control a little bit and a couple other things that kind of, again, blend into these different environments. 
But that's what we're talking about when we, we go through broken authentication. Not a real mysterious process, but one that if done incorrectly, leads to total and horrible compromise. And then you've got to stand before people going, well, judge, we did all we could. And he says, really? I got an expert sitting on a stand here says otherwise. So um, you don't want to be doing that. You don't want to have that conversation. I love the top three of the top 10 of this because while injection is a bit more technical, broken off and sensitive data exposure, well, sensitive data exposure a lot of times can be uh, another really silly mistake. And I, I say that most people are not publishing the information purposefully. It's usually by accident, some way, shape, or form. So how do, what does that mean? Well, let's read the definition. Many web applications and APIs, this is the uh, programming interface, right? The application, right? This is how uh, uh, you can help the, the end user interface with the, the application itself. This is usually done on the back end, uh, or, or, or I say back end, it's under the hood from what you see normally. You gotta use some special software to be able to actually look at that, or if you're developing something to work with this, um, you would know about APIs, you may have a key and everything will work with that. All right, so it says it does not properly protect sensitive data, such as financial, right? That's, uh, that's super important, healthcare, PHI, and PII, the personally identifiable information, PHI is healthcare information. Uh, so you don't you don't want to let this stuff get out. There's huge regulations against, especially with PHI, things like HIPAA, where massive fines and horrible, horrible things happen to you. I believe there's a flogging involved if you um, accidentally release some PHI. So uh, yeah, so Wes has got the whip. He's like. I signed up for that and it is fun to hit people <laughs> with, with sticks. <laughs> he doesn't do that. He's a very nice man. Um, right. So anyway, uh, sensitive data exposure. So what we're saying is we're, we have these types of data, personally identifiable information. Uh, we kind of joke around the office that it used to be called the phone book because it was your, your name, your address, your phone number, lots of really what we would now deem as sensitive information. We used to deliver to your doorstep uh, for all to have and see. Uh, I don't get those. No one throws them on my doorstep anymore. Um, but there's the internet, right? Because probably we're, we're saying that is sensitive stuff. We don't want to let that stuff get out, especially that healthcare information, especially financial information. I don't know about you, but I don't want people to have my financial information. But it's only in those, uh, those Gains can also be credit card numbers, expiration, passwords themselves. If they had a database with hash passwords, the function to map those passwords are, they're not just in plain text. If still explain that, and all someone has to do is trip over and find it, sensitive data exposure all day long. Now, that's the only way that this happens. Absolutely not. If I'm able to vulnerability that gives me access like a SQL injection and I'm then able to dump the database out to the web application and see all that well there you go you have sensitive data exposure and we're having an A1, A2 and A3 especially if I bypassed the authentication mechanism used SQL injection and then used another SQL injection to gain access to the data you see how this gets complicated uh, pretty quickly but it is fun if you're doing it I'm not gonna lie, it is kind of to see all that stuff happen. And you go, oh yeah, yeah, this is horrible for this person, but it me. So I get the appeal by the hackers, there's a thrill ride to it, uh, and then they make the money. So there's that, they're, they're in it for the green, but the thrill excites to some extent. Um, so sensitive data, I think of things like three buckets, right? Big one tools you can go and download from uh, people tools all the time to try to make the process of finding stuff a whole lot easier. So go out, open S3 books for me in Amazon AWS. And if I find one, let me know what it is. And now let's take a look at it. You can search all over the place to try to find those types of things. If you start footprinting and uh, doing reconnaissance against uh, an organization, if you're 
see what your organism has as far as sensitive data exposure. That would be a good methodology to go through, try to look for. Do we have anything that's exposed to the internet? Start directories, application to and see what it is there. Maybe you've got like a debugging flag turned on and that debug is if I do something wrong, all of a sudden all the debug information is showing on my screen. Might not be the smartest thing to let somebody on the outside see. And now they could use that and leverage it to gain some more access in the system. Or if it's just good information that could be profitable, they'll just take it and sell it. So there you go. Sensitive data exposure. I'm going to try to speed things up. Uh, we got, uh, how long do we got here? We got plenty of time. I'm going to let uh, Don tell me. He's shaking his head. We got plenty of time. Yeah, take your time. Um, you know, normally we run through to a bit past seven. So uh, feel free to move there. Roger that. Well, let's keep on rocking that. Okay, XML external entities. I find this one interesting because it's on the list. And it's a really kind of a, you don't see them very often anymore. When you do, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, this good for the hacker, right? That's good for the hacker. If you're the, if you're the security person for your organization and you find an exit issue, you're probably having some form of heart palpitation at a point in time, really freaking out, as you should. You should be freaking because that's bad. So uh, you, all, I, I'm starting to harp on this because typically this is with uh, what's called SOAP applications. More, more applications now it's called REST. So only dealing with SOAP are you really going to see these XXEs. And then even then, which is why I'm surprised to still see it, you have to have an insecure XML. So XML is the, the, um, the language that is being used. It's basically a way to just structure a data and feed it to the applications. You know, it's, it's human readable and really friendly. It's not a difficult thing to pick up and try to understand. You go, oh yeah, I kind of see what's going on here. Creating something like, like I don't know, password, right? And inside a password are uh, elements of what makes up a password. It's just, you just kind of type those out and it just kind of all gets chunked into a piece and sent on to the, to the application. The application brings it in and says, oh, ooh, this is nice. I know what to do with this, it all looks good. Let me use this, okay. Okay, I see what's going on. It's, it's a nice day for everybody. So the interesting thing, and this is where this XML external entities idea comes from is if I'm a smart person and I know a bit about how that system works, I can manipulate it if it's vulnerable uh, to giving me more information than it should, all right? And most of the time when you see a, a demonstration of this, it's a file read, right? I'm reading some file that's local to that remote system, not local to my machine that I'm attacking from, but local to the server itself. And those kind of things can lead to sensitive data exposure, can also lead to system X, depending on the right set of circumstances. I could get comprom I could compromise the system if I find an XXC attack. And the way this works is basically I'm allowed to define certain elements that's then going to be taken in and approved of without any kind of scrutiny. And that's hopefully something you're going to hear a lot and you're going to start to really realize many of these in the top 10, well, you could probably avoid a bad day at the beach if you just didn't trust anyone. It pays to be paranoid in security. That's how we stay out of having to tell people that we had a breach and maybe losing reputation, losing customers, having downtime, spending goo gobs of money on instant response. Doesn't sound like fun for anybody because it's not, it's, it's cool to learn about, but it's not cool to actually have to do because you've been breached. But, but uh, there you go. That's just a philosophical idea there. Well, let's get back into XXC just a little bit. So. You're, you're basically saying, I'm going to put some XML and I'm going to throw it in there and I want you to, to interpret it the right way. I want you to parse through it and it's going to tell you to do something. What's it going to tell you to do? It's going to tell you, I want you to read that file if it exists. If you could, that'd be great. So you reach into there, you grab that file, it spits it back out. 
once you see that, you know, you got the keys. I just saw a, some bug bounty hunter. I, I follow a lot of security people, obviously, uh, in my social media and everyday goings on. And they got two bug bounty uh, submissions returned for $4,000 each. They found two XXE attacks and got a payout of eight grand for both of them. So that's lucrative for security researchers to be able to go out there, understand. And it's number four on our list. That said, you probably are finding XXEs in older systems or maybe government. That's probably why they're getting a, a decent payout. Government usually pays up pretty well uh, because you hack the government and bad things occur to the nation's security. It's not just that system that we would like to save. I know I do. I don't know about you. I, I like being safe. Good news that the government is trying to encourage good security research, responsible disclosure to say, hey, I found a problem with your web app. There you go. If you feel like you are um, appreciative of that effort, I do take money. <laughs> and then they, they pay you out. We can play. But Bug Bounty is a way, like running down through this top 10 right here, Bug Bounty Hunters are all OWASP top 10 because this is their bread and butter. This is what they do. They're looking at web applications. They're looking for these insecurities specifically and just using this as a template of what should I be looking for? Let me learn about this app, see if I can find some of that and get that payday. We talk about it all the time um, on uh, Don and I on our podcast, people getting paid mad money. What was the, the Apple payout? I think it was like a hundred grand or something over a hundred grand, big time like a group of two or three or four people. That's a nice split. All right, so there's XML external entities, also known as XXE. Whew, this is a fun talk. We're, we're halfway through, we're halfway through. All right, so many insecurities, so many of them. Uh, and these are just the basic ideas behind them. Not, not all of them are specific, like XXE is. XXE is kind of a specific one. But broken access control, this is fun, right? So what is broken access control? Restrictions on what authenticated users are allowed to do uh, are often not properly enforced. You don't say. So you'll notice this is all coming back to the idea that we as the people that are implementing these things did not do due diligence. We have to be constantly assessing everything and then reassessing everything, making sure because this is shifting sand. These things move all the time. New stuff gets added, old stuff gets taken away. New implementations of old things are coming out. You know, oh, there's a better way to do that. Let me just take this out, bolt this in. Still does the same thing, but now it's more efficient and vulnerable, right? Maybe, who knows? So we have to be constantly looking at this. So broken access control is saying that restrictions on what authenticated users. So I authenticate to the system. What can I access? What can't I access? So maybe if I log in as a normal user, I probably don't have access to the admin panel. Doesn't make sense because I'm not an admin. So I shouldn't be able to access that. But this says it's usually or often not properly enforced. So you, you just kind of said, don't go there. Okay. That happens in different types of ways, but attackers can exploit these flaws to access unauthorized functionality and or data. Um, such as access to other users' accounts, use sensitive files. Hey, there's that uh, sensitive data exposure popping its ugly head. We're all the way down here in five, but that was number two, right? That was number two? No, that was number three. Sensitive data exposure, number three. Don't let me steer you wrong, right? Um, what else can they do? Modify other users' data because there was not a proper access mechanism wrapped around who could make those changes and therefore, able to make those changes. Uh, what else? Change access rights. So, yeah, I was able to log in, and I'm a standard user, but I was able to elevate myself to admin because you didn't stop me from doing it. And again, this is another one of those things where a lot of times this is kind of an under the hood idea where things are happening below the surface that you just don't normally see unless you go, hey, Pull that lever for me. Let's get old Bessie up in the air here and see 
what is going on inside of this machine? And then you go, uh, admin equals false. What is, why is it? Okay, admin equals false. Can I change that to true? I don't know. Why don't you give it a try? Okay, admin equals true. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm an admin now. There you go, right? Broken access control. There was nothing stopping me. There was no mechanism checking to make sure that if my name is this, yes, that should say admin equals false. But if it gets changed, is anybody checking for that? Does it, you see how it's going on? Or why does the user have access to that at all? Why are they seeing that? That's a mistake. It's sensitive data exposure and it's broken access control because now you're just, you're just making stuff up. This isn't fun for me as a developer. You can't do these things. As a security professional, you see this and you go, why, why am I seeing that? Why is this ab uh, ability happening that an end user will be able to interact with that piece of information and make modifications to it? We shouldn't be doing that. So let's figure out a different way to do it. But broken access control is one of those other things. It's just like you didn't set the right permissions on something, right? So you, maybe you've got an area of the web application you don't want people to see because it's sensitive. Uh, you have to have certain level of permissions. So you, you want to lock that down. If you don't lock that down, if you just leave it with standard permissions, then guess what's going to happen? They're going to, if they know how to do it, then the attacker would be able to just go there because they could find it using various automations and mechanisms to discover these types of things and go, hmm, I should not be able to see things like the PHP info file, right? Sensitive data exposure, but it's also gonna maybe give me a lot of information and I'm, I can bypass, if I can put some things together and make a neat little package, I can find myself on the wrong side of that server's capabilities. And that's what we want to steer clear of. So. Broken access control is just the basic idea is you're not really access or you're not really controlling access to resources. And if you are, you're not doing it well, you're not doing it in an effective way. So to understand a whole lot better of how, how should I be doing this? And then how can we implement that in a way that makes it work? Uh, I mean, cards on the table, doing security is hard, right? We see this all the time. Big companies, security companies, FireEye, right? Solar Winds, we saw them get hacked. We see uh, these big companies getting nailed, getting popped because finding every flaw and fixing it is a really hard thing to do. Finding every flaw, finding a flaw in a given system and exploiting it, difficult, but nowhere near as an impossible task as the former. So, the, the attackers have the have us at the advantage, right? So this is why we need to be doing things like penetration tests, vulnerability assessments, maybe even formal red teaming, de depending on how large your company is. And these are all just fancy terms for it. audit my security, find out where the flaws are. Let's see what we can do to fix them, especially the things that are low hanging fruit. There's just no good reason not to be checking for uh, your security. Even if you're a small shop with limited funds, there are tools you can license for uh, a fee, but a whole lot less than your company going under because you had a massive data breach and you know paying for the lawyers and all the things that go along with that would be. So you know you pay some money, it's, just think of it as insurance, right? We're gonna look for those flaws, we're gonna find the easy stuff we can fix, we're gonna fix that. We're gonna find the harder stuff we can fix, we're gonna spend some time and we're gonna fix that to make sure. And then we're gonna reassess after we do all the fixing to make sure the fix has actually worked, that they're doing the thing they need to do and that we don't discover new problems because you might you might be thinking, man, security seems like a, a never ending game of a losing. It can be, it's, it is a lot of work and this is why you see it as a problem. That's why we need more people, more eyes on the problem, more people understand what the problems are and know how to fix them and are engaged in doing that activity the better we're gonna be. So learn security. You don't have to be a security professional per se. Everybody is a part of the security of their organization, their home network, their one device, doesn't matter what it is, your personal, right? Your, your personal security, physical security. It's all up to you to, to play as big a part as you can in that, figure out what you can do to help increase that. 
that could be a, something as simple as taking security awareness training. Oh, I didn't know that phishing was a problem. I didn't know this was a problem. And now you do. Now you're more aware. Knowledge is power, and that's going to help us out. All right. Let's move on. Security misconfiguration. Security misconfiguration is the most commonly seen issue. You would think that would make it number one, wouldn't you? But no, the impact kind of plays a, a problem here. But this is totally true because what is broken access control but a security misconfiguration, right? It is the most common issue. This is commonly the result of insecure default configurations. Oh man, I love those. We'll get into that in just a second. Incomplete or ad hoc configurations, open cloud storage. Remember we talked about open S3 buckets, misconfigured HTTP headers, and verbose error message containing sensitive information. Not only must all operating systems, frameworks, libraries, and applications be securely configured, but they must be patched and updated in a timely fashion. Oh man, where do we begin with security misconfiguration? So much meat on the bone of this bad boy. Um, let's start off with default configurations. If you install software and it has a default configuration, you should change that. If it has something you can change, you should change that. No defaults should leave your system, right? Should be exposed. If you, if you can change it from a one to a two and that doesn't break anything, you just need to know that it was a two and not a one, then there you go. That's what you do, right? So these are things like passwords. It's got a default password. You better stink and change that because if not, people like me who have a much nastier disposition are gonna exploit that fact and log right into your system with full administrative permissions. That es no bueno, right? This is not things we like. Um, so you want to be changing that. Move it to a different area. Don't put it in the default dump. Hey, this is where we want to install the software. And eh, that sounds good, but I'm going to go with no. Let's put it over here. That way someone can't easily enumerate that maybe this software is this version or has these uh, elements to it that could give them, if they know about that software specifically, could give them information, right? So you move things around. It's all about obfuscation, right? That security through obscurity, while not a great um, standalone security practice, it does play a part in your layered defense. So I'm just kind of kind of move some stuff around. I'm going to make things a little bit more difficult. You just don't want to be the easiest target on earth. Is right? What's, what's the old adage about running from a bear? I don't have to be faster than the bear. I just have to be faster than the next person that's running away from the bear, right? That's the idea here is just be faster than the next person that's running from the attack. Let's see, what else they got? Uh, incomplete or ad hoc configuration. So you started doing some of that stuff, but you didn't finish because you had a deadline. That's totally understandable, but you need to make yourself a, a resolution to go back and complete that configuration to where it's as hardened as possible. Maybe follow a hardening guide if there's one available. Uh, what else? Open cloud storage. We talked about that. Misconfigured HTTP adders. This would be like allowing things like put. This is an HTTP method, right? If I can use that method, uh, if I can use headers that bring back or, or give me information as an attacker, well, I want to avoid that. So that would be a security misconfiguration. If it tells me, hey, here is the admin, you know, equals true function and that's an HT, it's inside of an HTTP header, we, we want to change that. Right? You got to make that different. Uh, verbose error messages, right? That, hey, here, you're running MySQL and you had a problem. Uh, version 5.3. whatever. Well, oh, man, that's just attackers are drooling. Oh, my goodness, you're just giving me all the wonderful info that I need to break into your system. So we want to stick away from that. So then it talks about patching and upgrading. Super important. It's super important. If you're not patching and upgrading, not just your operating system, but all the applications that you use, line of business apps, third-party apps, homegrown apps, right? All this stuff needs to be going through a constant upgrade cycle and patching cycle. You're going to need to get involved with some really good patch management systems that will help you in that lift because it can be a heavy lift. But we have to do our due diligence and you have to protect the systems that can't do that quickly. So maybe putting 
other security controls in place, maybe segmenting a network off or, um, or, or really controlling what can and cannot access certain things through network access control, things of that nature. So this is a big one. This is why they say it's probably the most common because there's so many different ways in which this could manifest itself. So uh, sir, a lot of really good ways in which they've talked about here though, that can give you patch management. Oh, man, that's a, that's a big one. And the uh, first one I think of is Equifax, right? Equifax got breached, the Stuxnet, or not, I'm sorry, not Stuxnet, but the uh, Apache Struts uh, vulnerability. They were six, nine months, there was a patch available and they did not patch. And that's how they were, that's how they were breached. So doing good patch management is one of the most important pieces of the defensive uh, side of things. All right, it's cross right scripting. We'll finish this up. We'll get through this, ladies and gentlemen. I know you guys are probably like, ah, oh, shut up. Enough of this. <laughs> it's fun for me. I enjoy it. All right, cross site scripting flaws. This is kind of fun where you've built a web application and it uses JavaScript or some other scripting language on the back end underneath the hood. You're taking, guess what, input from the user and you are trusting it. That's a problem, right? So what happens is, is when you do that, if it trusts my input and it's not doing any kind of filtering or sanitization of characters, special characters, then guess what can happen? Well, uh, I can tell it, hey, if you're running JavaScript, here's some JavaScript and it'll go, I will interpret and run that for you because it is code. And that's not what you typically want from your application by the end user. You don't want them putting in random JavaScript code into the system and it going, okay, I'll run that, right? Because if they can, they might go, hey, why don't you do this? Oh, my, did my, um, hold on, just, my camera just died. I'm gonna go to, where's the settings? Integrated camera, bam. Okay. Yeah, we, uh, we still see your desktop, you know, that's hey, hey. Uh, probably better. <laughs> I, have, I have two cameras, I'm good to go. I came, I came with a backup. But uh, anyway, back to cross-site scripting. So it's gonna interpret that and it's gonna run it and I can steal things like session cookies from other users, right? You'll see uh, cross-site scripting a lot of times. So there's three different types of cross-site scripting. Commonly, there is reflected cross-site scripting, there's stored cross-site scripting, and there's DOM-based cross-site scripting. And out of those three, the two big hitters are gonna be reflected and stored cross-site scripting attacks. So what I can do with a cross-site scripting or reflected attack is I look for places in the application where if I put something into the app, it reflects it back to me. So if it says, hey, what's your name? And I type in, my name's Daniel. It's a, and when I go to the next page, it says, hi, Daniel, welcome to, you know, cool web application. Uh, I know I'm looking at the wrong camera. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, it's gonna, I see my name, that's what I typed in. If I said my name was Purple Penguin, then it's going to say, hi, Purple Penguin, welcome to this web application. Okay, I know it's reflecting back the thing that I'm giving it. Now, will it interpret code for me and reflect that you know, back? Because that's a great place. Because then you can grab that URL and you can create, like um, use one of those URL shortening things, send out a great phishing email that says, hey, click this link. And that JavaScript is doing something malicious like stealing session tokens or changing passwords or doing all sorts of nefarious items, typically wanting to steal <laughs> steal something from the end user. The stored cross-site scripting is even worse because now the application itself is actually storing it. I don't have to send somebody an, uh, a link that would be malicious. I can send them a legitimate link that sends them to a malicious site that then does the nefarious thing that we don't want it to do, X, Y, and Z, steal cookies, install malware, the sky is the limit as far as horrible nightmare scenarios. So uh, this is why we see in cross-site scripting, I think it did take a bump down um, in, in order. I think it was a little higher in the 20, what was it, 14 versus 2013, somewhere in there. Um, so uh, you'll notice it says HTML or JavaScript, which is typically what we see with a cross-site scripting attack. So, all right, moving to insecure deserialization. Guess what? We've already kind of covered this. XXE is an insecure deserialization. 
This is where we're taking a bunch of data and we're kind of squishing it down into something like a chunk so that we can feed that chunk. And then when that chunk gets to the server end, it goes, it's a pretty package. Let's open the top and open it up and see what's inside. And it brings it all out and it goes, oh, I just ran a bunch of horrible code for this person. So this is the idea of an insecure serialization. So as you can see, it often leads to remote code execution. Even if the serialization flaws do not result in RCEs, they can be used to perform attacks, including replay attacks, injection attacks, and privilege escalation attacks. So still basically nightmare stuff that you don't want to have. This is, this is a pretty bad thing. I was actually playing around with a bit of this today. Uh, JSON web tokens, and there's Python pickles, and uh, a couple of different ways which you might see these uh, in a web application. You'll notice it's a little lower on the list. can be a bit heavier of a lift uh, as far as the technicalities of what it takes to it's, it's a bit of a complex attack, but remote code execution is a super impactful thing because now I'm getting the machine to actually do stuff that it wasn't intended to do. And it's what I want to do as an attacker, which is almost invariably not a good thing, okay? Uh, using components with known vulnerabilities, my goodness, it defines itself, right? Uh, it, may, it seems like it's telling you that you knew that this was a bad thing and you used it anyway. It's, it's a little misleading in the way they, they chose to word it. What it means is, is that I want to build a web app. Cool. Who doesn't, right? It's the age of the internet. I got to have an online presence. That's awesome. Everybody needs that, right? It's part of doing business nowadays. Well, I'm not a coder and I don't have money to hire a dev team or farm it out into a Fiverr or whatever, right? So what do I do? I go and look for an off the shelf solution that says, hey, this makes it easy. WordPress comes to mind, right? It's pretty simple. Follow the bouncing ball. You get it installed. You now have it up and running. You have a web presence. Yay. You're awesome. You're feeling good, right? Well, the problem is, is that if you don't know that the version of the software you just installed has a horrible security flaw, then you are using a component with a known vulnerability. Doesn't mean that you know it necessarily, it just means that it is known to have vulnerabilities. So you'll notice it says such as libraries, frameworks, and other software modules with the same privileges as the application. Hopefully you're not running an application as a power user or an administrator. If a vulnerable component is exploited, such an attack can facilitate serious data loss or server takeover. Applications and APIs using components with known vulnerabilities may undermine application defenses and enable various attack impacts. So gonna basically bypass all your other security measures because is with some form of elevated privilege. And since it's doing that and it has a security flaw, which is known by the community, probably has some sort of proof of concept that you can just go onto the internet and find and use. As an attacker, this is a great day for me. I see this from time to time. Oh, this is an old version of Drupal. This is an old version of WordPress. Or I do a search for the plugin that is not this specific framework. It's got a problem. I log in. I'm happy. It's running code for me. It's a good day had by all. So what do we do? Back to the idea of patching, right? Staying on top of doing updates, making sure we're running the latest and greatest. If we have software that has a like a very new found vulnerability, but it's extremely impactful, you know, you're going to have to probably go offline at that point, or maybe uh, switch to a different uh, solution that doesn't have those flaws. Unfortunately, that does happen from time to time. But for the most part, these companies do a really good job. Most companies do of saying somebody researched it, somebody found it. We have built a patch, and now we're releasing that to the world. If you have this problem patch now and alerting their end users to do that. So that's that's what it's all about when it comes to using components with known vulnerabilities. Just make sure you do your due diligence to make sure that anything that you are running on your site that is an off the shelf solution, something that has been around the block that you look for those vulnerabilities before you get too invested into using it. And if you are invested into using it, find the solution to fixing that, All right? All right, and number 10, we have finally made it to the bottom. Insufficient logging and monitoring. Right down here, I'll just do that. 
So it's coupled with missing or ineffective integration with incident response allows attackers to further attack systems, maintain persistence, pivot to more systems and tamper, extract or destroy data. Most breach studies show time to detect a breach is over 200 days. It was funny, I was talking to somebody and they said, that's the gestational period of a human child. I'm like, that's a long time for an attacker to be in your system gestating <laughs> and you not know about it, right? At least a woman knows like, there was a baby inside of me. I can, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some of the, uh, this is why we do threat hunting, right? So we can find these things. Uh, so what are we talking about here? So kind of the opposite of what we we're talking about before when I said, uh, maybe you've turned on some of um, uh, debugging options, right? It's giving you that information, except this is an event has occurred. Let me log that event. Somebody logged in. Cool. Log that event. And then monitor that that is happening. It's not good enough to just be logging. You can log till you're blue in the face, log everything that happens on your system. It does no good if you are not actually observing and looking for things that could be problems. So this is the idea of using something like a seam where logs are being aggregated into one specific system and it has rules to try to figure out whether or not the logs that it is seeing should be flagged as suspicious or harmful, and then alerting you as the end user to go, hey, there could be a problem, you might wanna check that out. And then for us to not go, oh, I hate when I get these emails, delete, 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 or create an Outlook rule that says, anything from seam at mycompany.com goes straight to the garbage uh, and then completely ignored, right? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And it could be even the fact that uh, logging could be a performance degradation to your application, but it needs to be done, right? You have to make that decision. And I would err on the side of caution when coming to do that, I would err on the side of, let's just go ahead and log some stuff and do the heavy lift. Yeah, it's gonna be more difficult. We're gonna take a performance hit, but not as big a, a, a performance hit as if we were to, uh, I don't know, get a data breach, right? So that would be bad. So whew, I think we've walked through all of these pretty sufficiently. Hopefully I've, I've explained them in a way that helps you guys understand it and make sense of it and to see why these are dangerous. And even though some of them seem pretty silly on their face and actually kind of are, um, it's, it, it's the name of the game, it's what's going on. You have to be able to, if you don't know they exist, they're not so silly when you get that data breach. So uh, yeah, there you go. Well, do we take questions now or chat or what do we do? Absolutely. And, and Daniel, you know, thank you for doing such a great job in that presentation. Some of these can be very confusing. And so getting it kind of turned into plain English is, I think, a really useful thing. Uh, I do want to open up the floor for questions that any of you may have. Uh, I've got everybody muted right now, but if you uh, use the raise your hand button, so down at the bottom, if you click reactions, you'll have a raise your hand button. Uh, or I think if you're on the web client, it might be a little bit different. But uh, if anybody has a question, go ahead and raise your hand. And uh, I will, I'll kick off with one quick question. Daniel, did you say these were, these were in order by severity, not necessarily how common they occur, right? It's, it's kind of a combination of how often they occur and the severity of them. So that's why you might see something that would give you something like RCE, like insecure deserialization, where it's severity is high, but not very common. So it's lower on the list. We're not seeing it as often because there are more protections there um, to help keep that from happening. Most of the um, um, functions that are mechanisms that will work with deserialization are good at making sure there are proper updates. They, they kind of make you opt into security as you continue to use them. All right. And I, I know you do a lot of capture the flag events where, you know, you're presented a, a virtual machine like a lab or a, a server and you've got to find a way into a weasel your way in. And a lot of times you use things that have come right out of this list. Do you actively think about the OWASP top 10 list when you're doing a compromise like that? Or do you just focus in on like two or three of these? Yeah, um, I you kind of keep it like a running tally in the back of your head if you're familiar with the with the list 
as you start to explore a web application and something like a capture the flag, you're constantly thinking, oh, that might be a good spot for SQL injection that, that has all the hallmarks of what I've seen for SQL injection. So I'm gonna write that down as a possibility and kind of prioritize your list and then go, oh, now you know I can log in and I've got, oh, it's reflecting things back to me. Maybe some cross-site scripting is gonna go here. And you know that that's typically how I'm doing it. Uh, there's a lot going on with most web applications. Like if you were to actually go to somebody's website and use something like Burp Suite to see what's happening under the hood, you would see a lot of calls that are being done. And with CTFs, you typically don't see that level of depth. But in a real web app, there's going to be so many different places. So there's more. It takes longer to get through it. But it's more you're more apt to find one of these things in something whereas a ctf is kind of a pointed thing it's really meant for you to, to find x y or z juice shop on the other hand by oasp to have every one of these in it somewhere right and to varying degrees of difficulty so if you really want to get like some good hands-on it's a pretty well built out application it's not too difficult to to throw on a on a virtual machine and and start playing with and have access to it, uh, I found it quite easy. The the instructions on their GitHub page is spot on. It's right to the point. So if you want to kind of like start looking at some of this stuff and seeing how it works, coupling the top ten with Juice Shop and kind of getting in there and playing with that stuff is a great way to do it. All right. Did anybody else have any questions before we wrap this one up? Uh, Michael, go ahead. Oh, you are muted. <laughs> that was it great. Let, it wouldn't let me unmute. Yeah. Um, I did try, I promise. Um, are there, uh, is there a standard list of libraries like by language or by infrastructure platform that, um, allow you to mitigate some of these automatically or almost automatically, you know, like for PHP, SQL injection or uh, JavaScript, you know, cross-site scripting? So some of them will be programmatic. So it's just not so much that you're using a library or something, but it's the way you, you programmed it to work could be giving you the problem. So that's going to be part of it. That's going to be doing like the static application testing where you're looking through the code, looking for logic errors or race conditions and things of that nature. Um, on the other hand, if you are using a library that does have, or a function, a method, a call, or whatever the case could be, that does have a security flaw, a lot of these things will, like I think, I think C++ will kind of complain at you if you use things like puts. Like, hey, this isn't, you know, when you go to compile, it's kind of warn you. Puts is a bad idea. You, you don't want to be doing that. Um, if you look in documentation, so if you're trying to implement something, uh, I deal mostly with Python. So if, I, if I'm writing something in Python and there is a security issue with that, a lot of times in the documentation itself will say, there are no security issues with this library. Take that into account if you're going to use this. And so uh, from my experience, there has been a bit of that. I like it better when, uh, I like that they do that, that they tell you that. I like it a whole lot better when they kind of force you into security instead of out of security. Like by default, there is no security. If you want security, you've got to kind of opt into it. Um, so they, they can say, well, we have security and you go, great, but by default, it doesn't do it. And I was just coding up a, a, an app to do X, Y, or Z so I used that that library, and now I got a horrible data breach, and I'm ready to burn your building down, you know, because you didn't tell me that. So why didn't you do the secure thing by default? So I think I think a lot of uh, languages and, and systems are starting to see that as a problem. And go, yeah, we kind of probably should just by default tell them, hey, this is secure. If you want to go insecure, that's your business. We're gonna let you do that because you're the user and you know what's best, right? You, hopefully, you know what's best and kind of like allowing you to opt out of security instead of the other way around. Okay. 
All right, Robert. Hey, uh, I was wondering for someone who I don't, I don't, hard, I don't, I don't really have a whole lot of IT experience, but for somebody who's wanting to get into the field, um, is there a, a route that you would suggest? Well, I, it's a very, um, there are some generalities. Yes, I can give you those. And then you, then you got to get specific, right? You kind of, you kind of move this down this funnel when it comes to getting into IT and then into cybersecurity specifically. So um, we'll, we'll go ahead and do a one-to-one -one case here. What is, what would you say your level of IT experience is? Novice, um, <laughs> enthusiast. If if my uh, internet doesn't work, I unplug my router and I plug it back in. Uh, so <laughs> no, you're, level one tech, you're level three tech. Well, great. I mean, as far as um, uh, networking goes, um, there's a, I don't, I know some of y'all from Gainesville. There's a, a building or a company called, it was service owned, then client logic, then Cytel in Lake city, Florida. I don't know what it's called now, but me and another individual network that entire building, but that was years ago. Um, okay. But as far as on the software side goes, it's minimal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's good. That lets me kind of give you a, a more personalized uh, doing this because you, you seem to already have a pretty good tech generalist background. You understand networking to some extent, you understand operating systems to some extent, and you can get them talking and doing things, which is always great. So from there, you're going to want to start to focus more on security. And again, more in a generalized space. You don't have to become a software developer per se. Um, the more you know about development, I, I've had this conversation with Wes quite a few times here recently. It is extremely helpful. So I would learn some security concepts like uh, uh, like Security Plus is really a good, good place to start. It's CompTIA. They've been around. They know what is the temperature of the water at this point in time when it comes to security practices and general security um, concepts that you need to be aware of. And from there, pick a programming language and learn it. It doesn't matter what it is, just, just learn it. And it's gonna be like, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I don't know why I'm learning this. That it's gonna pay dividends as you move down the funnel, okay? So pick a program. There's lots of really good ones that are not too difficult to understand. Python, Ruby, Go, Rust. You don't have to start with something like C or C++, which is a bit more formal. Uh, these are these are all much more high-level languages that allow you to kind of really get into them. Honestly, I would even say learn some Linux. And while you're learning Linux, learn how to do Bash script because Bash is a, is a very... A basic yet powerful, simple programming language. So you'll learn all the programming concepts or a lot of programming concepts, how to write loops, how to work with conditional logic, like ifs, like if do if not this, then do that kind of thing. If else uh, statements. Yeah, uh, working with variables and arrays and lists and you get all that exposure. Plus it's super helpful when you're working in Linux environments to be able to script something up and say, hey, do this for me automatically. I've written tons of tools in bash and it did exactly what I wanted to do. And it did it really effectively. And it did it. It was super easy to do because I wasn't fighting with something like, Oh, this is not a, I gave it a string like object and not a bytes like object. And now it's complaining at me. You know, it just, it's just the operating system going, Hey, what do you want me to do? So I, I do not discount bash as a first language. It, it's, it's super easy to, to learn. And it's applicable like right out of the gates. So definitely learn some Linux. You're going to need that. That's just the name of the game as you move into security. Then you've got to figure out, do I want to be offensive security or do I want to be defensive security? Does the thing that twirl my beanie, is that all about like implementing firewalls and writing the perfect rule set that's going to give me efficiency and functionality and yet keep the bad guys out, working with antivirus and endpoint protections and cyber threat intelligence and trying to do some like threat modeling and risk analysis and analyzing things like, you know, trying, trying to stop phishing attempts against my organization. That's the kind of stuff that's like, yeah, I'm going to stop these a-holes in their tracks. Then, you know, that's the blue team side. That's defensive. If you're like, you know what I want to do? I want to be a hacker, but I don't want to be a jerk about it. 
because hacking seems like a lot of fun because it is. And <laughs> you know, I want to kind of do that, that sexy, cool stuff that hackers do and get paid to do it. Then red team or offensive security is going to be the way you want to go. And that's where you learn how to exploit those problems and gain access into the systems and grab sensitive data, uh, gain um, uh, maybe even remote code execution to the machine, even having shell access to the system itself. So it's super fun. You can then take that and move into like bug bounty hunting, which is specifically against web applications like what we're talking today. But there's also wireless penetration testers and physical penetration testers, people that actually go to um, sites and check site security. Are there locks on the doors? Can I pick said lock on said door? Can I badge, can I clone badges and, and gain access that way or get, you know, piggyback or tailgate and do all those things? That would be site security, physical security. So um, lots of lots of fun on that side of the fence. Still has a, I'm telling you all the fun things, but there are some administrative things to that as well. You're going to be writing reports. You're going to be talking to C-levels. You're going to be pitching. I, you know, you're going to have short amount of time. 20% of the time in a red in a red teaming experience is done doing the fun, sexy stuff. The other 80% of the time is scoping the engagement, talking with lawyers, signing paperwork, bringing up statements of work and uh, you know definitions of done and all this other stuff and creating get out of jail free cards and who, building out lists of contacts of who, uh, if I get busted doing this, who do I call? Will they be available? If they're not available, who is available? Because there has been, um, like, the if you look up the cold fire incident that happened a year or two ago, that was a bad day at the beach for a couple of pen testers. So um, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. It is, but it does have that, that super fun element. But honestly, the blue team's got forensics, investigation, stuff with doing instant response. There's a lot of cool stuff on both sides of the fence. You just have to figure out what you want to do. And then start moving toward building that knowledge base so that you can market yourself to the companies that are looking for that. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, man. All right. Anybody have any other questions for Daniel? All right. Well, if not, Daniel, I want to uh, <clears throat> repeat my thanks to you. You know, it's a, a really interesting world out there right now. A lot of IT security issues going on. So every little bit of knowledge we can get in that spot is, is certainly valuable to us. And you did give us a little bit of knowledge. Uh, <laughs> so uh, definitely thank you for that. And, uh, and thank you for answering the questions. You know, everybody has a, a different take on this. So uh, nice to get a little more detailed information there. So thanks again. Uh -huh. um, the, oh, good. Yeah, I was just, I'm glad to do it. So for the rest of you, thank you for attending. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the presentation. You know, we've got a speaker lined up for next month, which is uh, going to be Mr. Chris Ward, who's going to be talking about some of the challenges of working from home and how to be more efficient at doing that. So I encourage you guys to attend uh, next month as well as every month. You know, be sure to keep an eye out for our uh updates via email. If you're not on our update list, jump over to aitp-ncfl.org and you can sign up for our email list. You'll get notified. Notif notified. Apparently I'm making up new words. Uh, it's a very advanced system. Uh, you can also join our group on meetup.com, which is the Gainesville Tech uh, Association of IT Professionals meetup group. So whichever way you want to go to find out about our sessions and stay up to date on what's new and exciting. But otherwise, I think it's a good spot for us to wrap this one up. I'm going to go ahead and stop our session recording.